Good evening and welcome to our last, second last night of this incredible journey with Pastor Gary Kant. What an incredible journey it has been. We thank God for the last eight nights. I'd like to welcome you wherever you are tuning in from. Special welcome to our friends from the mountains of Efogi, Nadori, Olaini Watchlong, Colpless Goroka. Thank you. Thank you, Lostap Wantemibla. Olaini Watchlong, Tabubil, Bulolo Nawau, Kivori Poe Long, Central Province. Mibla Tok, thank you, Long Yustap Wantemibla, Long Last Plate Night, na now I mean the second last night. Olaini we watch Long NCD. For those who are viewing tonight, right around the city, nine mile big screen, wherever you're watching, thank you very much. Tonight's topic is a very interesting topic and it's a very powerful topic as well. It is my prayer that you will be blessed by the messages. Sit back and enjoy the messaging song from the Guina Praise. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a wonderful privilege tonight to listen to your words. 
What are we watching tonight? May the Holy Spirit touch our hearts and our minds. As a seventh, Pastor Gary Ken speaks. May you sing once more for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Gary Kent is a television evangelist and is also a public evangelist. This is his second last night. Please, let's make welcome Pastor Gary Kent. Good evening, friends. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to meet with you here. And I want to give you a warm welcome tonight to the eighth or ninth program in our series, our Incredible Journey series. We're all on this incredible journey of life, a journey that takes us from here to eternity, a journey that takes us from this world to the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. And our guide on this journey is Jesus Christ. And Jesus has given us his guidebook for this journey. And uh, that guidebook is his word, the Bible. The Bible is like a map that God has given us to show us the way on our journey. In the Bible, God gives us wonderful information. In the Bible, he outlines his plan for Papua New Guinea. In the Bible, God shares his special message for Papua New Guinea. We find God's signs in Papua New Guinea. Friends, all the information we need on the journey of life is found in God's Word, the Bible. God shows us the way through His Word, the Bible. It leads us, it guides us, it directs us. The Bible contains all the information we need for our journey to God's holy city, the New Jerusalem. Tonight, we are going to open the Bible, God's guidebook, to identify God's people in PNG. (coughs) Friends, have you ever wondered why there are so many different churches today? The average person is confused. Where did they all come from? Amongst all these churches, how can we find the truth? Our topic of study tonight is why there are so many different churches. How do we decide which one to attend? Which one is the right one? God tells us in his book, the Bible, in the book of Amos, chapter 3 and verse 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Let's go to God's word. Remember that it doesn't matter what I think or what anyone thinks. What really matters is what God thinks and what is written in God's word, the Bible. If it's in the Bible, then we can believe it. How can sincere people tonight sort out all the different claims that different religious groups make? How can we decide what is right and what is wrong?
young friend, Timothy. And I want you to notice what he said here in Timothy, the third chapter and verse 15. He says, I write that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. And then listen as he goes further. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, friends, here Paul clearly states that God's church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. But how do we discover which church has the truth? How do we make that decision? There are so many denominations, and there are so many different ideas and beliefs, so much controversy, so much confusion in the religious community. My friends, according to the Bible, Jesus never intended that there be any confusion, and certainly not all these different denominations. I want you to listen to the prayer of Jesus just before he was crucified. Just before he was nailed to the cross, Jesus prayed this in John chapter 17 and verse 21. He prayed that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. You notice, friends, here in this text, God prays that his people be united, that they all be one. You notice? That is God's intention for his people. In fact, Paul wrote that there should be no schism, that is division, there should be no division in the body. That's what he wrote in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and verse 15. And then we read in Acts, the 20th chapter, verses 22, 28 to 30. Notice again what God's word, the Bible says. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. Here is a warning. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to the flock, the shepherd to the shepherd, the church of God. For I know this, Paul says, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And so here Paul warns us that soon after the time of Jesus, Savage wolves would come in among the flock. False teachers would come into the church, not sparing the flock. And notice what he says would happen. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. And so here, my friends, God warned us how division, even though it is not God's will, it is not God's plan for his church. He explains to us here, he warns us that division will come in because false teachers will come into the church and they will start teaching things that are not found in the Bible. They will teach things that are not true and they will draw disciples away to themselves get disciples to follow after themselves. And so here, the Apostle Paul warns us that there will come division amongst the churches. There will come division amongst God's people. People will all not always not follow the truth of the Bible. They will follow after false teachers, and they will believe things that are not found in the Bible. And he says that this will cause division. This will bring division. And my friends, as we turn the pages of church history, we discover that that is exactly what happened. 
the Bible was right. Just as God warned, false teachers arose and some people accepted their errors and they left the true church, the church of God. Disciples were drawn away and there was a gradual falling away from the teaching of Jesus and the truth of the Bible. But my friends, through it all, through it all, God has had a group of people, faithful people, a church that remained true to the teachings of the Bible, a group of people that always followed Jesus as their leader and the Bible as their authority in religious matters. My friends, we do not have to study the teachings of all denominations for long hours in order to find God's true people. If we know the characteristics of God's true church as given in the Bible, we will very quickly be able to identify God's true believers, those who follow the teachings of Jesus and the truths of the Bible. My friends, God does not leave us to guess which one it is. For God has given us the facts in his word. Notice again what he says in Amos, the third chapter and verse seven. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. In the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, God gives special insights into this period of history right down just before Jesus comes. He gives us special insights into the last days of earth's history. Here, the apostasy and religious confusion to exist in the last days of earth's history, Jesus predicts. God's word foretells us about the divisions that would come into the religious community. Here, it's all foretold in the book of Revelation. And my friends, in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, God gives us a, a panoramic view of church history from Christ's time right down to the end of the world. Here in Revelation chapter 12, God outlines what is going to happen to the Christian church. And God tells us how you and I can identify God's true church in the last period of history. All that information, my friends, is given to us in the last book of the Bible, especially for the last generation on planet Earth. And so, friends, God gives us all the information we need to identify his people in PNG in the 21st century. Here it is. God gives this great prophecy, this overview that tells the, the history, the story of what's going to happen to the Christian church down through the ages. Notice what it says here in Revelation chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Notice as we read further. And the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So here God is painting a prophetic picture for us. You notice here, the details are given. And we read on, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Now my friends, this is quite a symbol that God has given us here. A woman in white, clothed with the sun, standing on the moon with a crown of 12 stars. Here we have some valuable information that God is giving us about his people, about his church. Now, in prophecy, 
a pure woman, a woman in white, represents God's people, his true church. You see, the prophet, the prophet Jeremiah wrote, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Who is Zion? Through the prophet Isaiah, God has said, say to Zion, you are my people. And so as we link these two texts, we see that God uses a virtuous woman, a pure woman, a woman in white to represent his true church. And so here, friends, God is talking about his people in the last days. Right down through history, as we come to the close of history, we find the identifying marks of God's true church. Now, however, John was also shown in this same prophecy, he was shown another woman who he described a few chapters further on in Revelation chapter 17. I want you to notice here, friends, John describes another woman here, a very different woman from the woman in white. In fact, she is just the opposite. Listen to what he says here in Revelation, the 17th chapter, and verses 3 to 5. He says, And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand, what? A golden cup a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornications. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now here, friends, the symbolic language is just the opposite of the woman in white. Here we have not a pure woman, not a woman in white. Here we have an impure woman, a woman in scarlet. And this symbolic language of an impure woman describes the false church. The fallen church that has been unfaithful to Jesus and has compromised the truth of his word, the Bible. James uses similar words to describe those who forsake God's teachings, who leave it alone, who turn their back on God and his Bible and forsake God's teachings and join the world. I want you to listen to what he says here. The book of James, notice what he says. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And so, my friends, in Bible prophecy, there are two women. There's a fallen woman, and there's a pure woman. The fallen woman represents a false church, and the pure woman represents a pure church, God's true church. And so, do you follow me, friends? We have here in the great prophecies of Revelation an outline of the history of the church down through the ages until we come to the final period just before Jesus comes, the period in which you and I are living. And God says there will be two groups. There will be a true church, a faithful church, a woman in white, and then there will be a, an unfaithful woman, an impure woman, a woman in scarlet, the false church. And so, friends... You and I will have to make a decision as to which group we are going to belong to. Let us go back to our prophecy now. Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 2 and 4. Notice what it says. Speaking about the woman in white, the pure church. Notice what it says here. Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 2. She, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And the dragon, 
the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And it goes on. And war broke out in heaven because now, friends, you and I want to identify who the dragon is. We want to find out who this dragon is. You notice what it says? And war broke out in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought with who? With the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was found place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon, now we're going to identify who the dragon was. The great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called who? Called the devil and Satan, who deceives how many people, friends? Who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation also describes the child. So now we've identified who the dragon was. We know the woman is the true church. We know the dragon is the devil. And friends, the Bible also identifies who the child was. Now notice what it says here in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. She bore a male child. Now this is talking about the pure woman, the woman in white, God's people. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. The child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, my friends, only one child in the history of the world was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and then be caught up to God and his throne. And that was Jesus. Speaking of his second coming, the second coming of Christ, John said, now out of his mouth, this is talking about Christ, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with what? <clears throat> a rod of iron. My friends, this is talking about Jesus Christ, and it tells us that Jesus Christ is the one who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Paul tells us how Jesus was caught up to God's throne. Notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. When God raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand in heavenly places. And so my friends, Jesus was the male child that the dragon, Satan, attempted to destroy. Working through pagan Rome, Satan tried to take Jesus' life as soon as he was born. Remember the story? Herod, the Roman governor, decreed that all the male children two years and under should be killed. But an angel came and warned Mary and Joseph to escape to Egypt. The devil then tempted Jesus throughout his ministry, hoping to block God's plan to save our fallen world. Satan did everything he could to destroy Jesus. He did everything he could to wreck his ministry. When Christ's body hung on the cross, Satan was certain that he had won the battle. He was sure that he had won at last. But my friends, when Jesus was resurrected, an empty tomb showed Satan that he had been totally defeated. Christ arose, and my friends, he ascended to his Father's throne, just as Revelation describes, just as God predicted. Satan failed in his attempt to destroy God's Son. And so you know what he did then? He turned his anger he turned his anger on the woman in white, the true church, the Christian church. 
You see, friends, what had happened, Satan could no longer touch Jesus when Jesus had ascended to heaven. But Satan was angry. And so he turned his vicious attack onto the followers of Jesus, the believers of Jesus. He viciously attacked Christ's followers. Do you know that all but one of Christ's disciples were killed? They died a martyr's death. Satan was angry, and because he could not attack Jesus, he now attacked the followers of Jesus. The apostle Paul was beheaded outside the walls of Rome. Christians were tortured and thrown into dungeon. Many, many of them were killed. But my friends, as long as the disciples were alive, The church of God, the woman in white, stood firmly for the truth of God. They followed the Bible and its teachings. Everything they did was based on the example of Jesus and on his word, the Bible. They remained true to God. They remained true to the Bible. But sadly, after the death of the apostles, with the passing of time, Some Christians compromised their faith. They turned away from God's truth in the Bible. And false teachings began to creep into the church. False teachings began to enter the church. And then in the fourth century, Emperor Constantine, the emperor of the Roman Empire, he wanted to keep his empire together, and he did so by uniting pagans and Christians, bringing them together into one great system of religion. And my friends, when the pagans came into the church, they brought their pagan beliefs with them, and the church was compromised as the church embraced and accepted these errors, these pagan ideas, it lost sight of many of the great truths found in the Bible. I want you to notice what one historian wrote. The new... Into the church. They said, we are going to continue to worship the true God. We are going to continue to base all our beliefs on the Bible and the Bible only. They refused to compromise their beliefs, and many were persecuted as a result. In fact, soon the Roman emperors issued edicts, making it a crime punishable by death to reject the false practices of the state church. And so, my friends, the church became corrupted. John foresaw it all. God had given all this information in his word, the Bible. It was all predicted in God's word in the great prophecy of Revelation 12. I want you to notice as we read the prophecy further in Revelation, the 12th chapter and verse 13. Notice what it says. The dragon persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And what happened to the woman? Notice, my friends, as we read further. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by who? By God, 
And so, my friends, as paganism and pagan ideas entered the church, those who were, remained true to God and the Bible, they were persecuted. And in order to save themselves, save their lives, and save their ability to worship God according to the Bible, they fled out into the wilderness. They found places to hide up in the mountains and the caves. Just as the Bible predicted, faithful Christians who continued to follow God and the truths revealed in God's word found that the only way to preserve their lives and their faith was to flee, to escape, just as Revelation predicted. The woman fled into the wilderness. The true people of God fled into the wilderness. The truth could not be practiced openly any longer. People like the Waldenses, the Albigenses, and other faithful Christians fled into the Alps, the mountains of northern Italy and southern France, and the Huguenots scattered throughout France. They settled in hidden valleys, in remote caves, and in high mountains. They were hunted down as criminals, and many of them were killed. What was their only crime? They would not give up the teachings of Jesus. Oh, my friends, they are determined that they were going to be faithful to God and they were going to continue to worship God according to what is outlined in his word, the Bible. They would not compromise the truth of God. They would not accept false and pagan ideas and teachings. Oh, friends, millions of Christians, millions of God's people died rather than compromise their faith. Some historians estimate the death toll to be as high as 50 million. But my friends, here's the good news. God's truth finally triumphed. The Bible was translated into the language of the people and through the invention of the printing press was carried and scattered throughout the world. No longer was the truth of God to be hidden. It was now to be revealed. You see, friends, we've moved down through time, and we are down now getting to the closing stages of earth's history. The truth of God was to be revealed again. It's not to be hidden any longer. The truth of God is to be proclaimed to all mankind. And so courageous reformers boldly proclaimed God's word. Some like us and Jerome were burned at the stake. Others like Luther, Wycliffe, Tyndale were hunted and persecuted. However, my friends, with the discovery of America, new freedom and a new refuge was provided for the persecuted Christians of Europe. And many of these Bible-believing Christians living in Europe moved, traveled, to America, where they could read their Bibles and practice their religion in peace. Oh, my friends, the time had come for the pure faith to come out into the open again. The true church must no longer be hidden in the wilderness. I want you to notice how the prophet described the true church of God that comes out of the wilderness, that comes out into the open again. Notice what it says in Revelation, the 12th chapter and verse 17, as we continue this great prophecy regarding the history of the true church. The dragon was wroth or angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep what? The commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Oh, my friends, a remnant is the last portion of cloth left over from a larger piece. And just so, the remnant of God's church is the last part of that pure faith those who remain true and faithful to God, his church that exists at the very end time, just before Jesus returns. And so, my friends, translating this verse here in Revelation literally, we would say the devil was angry and went to make war with the last day church of God. 
Satan is furious with God's church, God's people. Those who still follow the truth of God in these last days. Now, my friends, John describes two characteristics by which we can recognize his last day people, his last day church. Do you remember what he said there in Revelation, the 12th chapter? The dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, God's church in the last days, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Oh, my first, the, friends, the remnant are those who keep all the commandments of God. Do you notice? They keep all the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what God says in his word, the Bible. Let me say again, friends, God's people in the last days will be those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You might be saying to me this evening, but doesn't every church teach that we should obey God's commands? Well, not exactly, friends. Many religious bodies teach their members in one way or another to disobey or break God's commandments. For example, some congregations are taught to bow before idols, bow before images, and most of the religious world has lost sight of the memorial of creation described in the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment of God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, friends, remember, God's word says that his people in the last days will keep his commandments, all of them, including the fourth one, which says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? The Sabbath of the Lord your God. Oh, friends, not only was God's remnant or last day church to keep the commandments of God, but it was also to have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you notice that? It was also to have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, friends, the Bible gives us the answer. The Bible gives us the answer. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, the Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so, my friends, God's last day church will have the gifts of the spirit including the gift of prophecy. Now, God gives several other characteristics to help us identify and uh, discover his last day people, his last day church. Let's just briefly review some of the distinguishing characteristics of God's last day church as given in the Bible. They will have the faith of Jesus and they will keep all the commandments of God. They will proclaim a special warning message of, found in Revelation, the 14th chapter, that is to be proclaimed to all the world to prepare people for the return of Jesus Christ. And then fourth, they will have the gifts of the Spirit, including the gift of prophecy. Now, my friends, all churches may look alike at first glance, but as you study God's word, the description of the genuine church of God in his word is quite easy to identify as we eliminate those that do not have these biblical characteristics. Perhaps you've been searching, trying to find God's true people in Papua New Guinea, trying to... <clears throat> make sense of the religious confusion that we see in the world today as you look for God's last day church. My friends, I believe that God does have a people here in PNG. I believe that there is only one true church. It's a Bible-believing church. 
It's a Christ-centered church. It's a Sabbath-keeping church. It's a worldwide movement. It's a group of people, a church that teaches what Jesus taught. Now, my friends, I myself have been searching for the truth. I have been searching for God's people in the last days who keep all the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's why tonight I am a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist today simply because I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to believe what Jesus believed. I want to believe what Jesus taught. I want to believe what's in the Bible. Jesus believed that death was asleep. I want to believe the same. Jesus taught that he would come back again. I want to look forward to that day. Jesus kept the seventh day Sabbath holy, and he expected his followers to do likewise. And so I want to worship on Saturday, on God's Sabbath, just like Jesus did. Yes, friends, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to belong to a group of people who follow the teachings of Jesus. I want to worship on the day that Jesus worshipped. I know that each of us, each of us are growing in our understanding of Bible truth. But I just want to follow Jesus as closely as I possibly can. How about you, friend? As you study your Bible, as you listen to these messages from the Bible night after night, have you learned new truth? Have you experienced God guiding you on your incredible journey to heaven? Have you heard the Spirit speaking to your heart to follow Jesus more closely as well? Do you want to be like Jesus? His voice always calls us up higher to a more abundant life. When Jesus teaches us truth, we are blessed if we follow it. My friends, I want you to listen to what Jesus said in John the 13th chapter and verse 17. He says here, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Oh, my friends, tonight... I believe that God has a people here in PNG. And I believe that God is inviting us to make the most important decisions of our lives. Do you believe that you've heard God's word preached during this series? Do you believe that we are following the Bible and the Bible only in what is being proclaimed? Oh, my friends... Jesus is coming soon. He's coming to take his people home. And I want to be part of that group who are followers of Jesus, who keep all the commandments of God, and who follow the example of Jesus in all that they do in religious matters. Oh, my friends, the Holy Spirit has been impressing your heart from night to night. When we hear God's word, when we listen to God's truth, the Holy Spirit impresses us to make a decision. And when truth comes to us, when God speaks to us through his word, the Bible, through his spirit, when he speaks to our heart, oh, my friends, we cannot remain the same. When the light of truth shines in, our hearts cannot possibly remain as they were before. Oh, friends, the choices we make determine the direction we're headed. The choices we make will determine our eternal destiny. Oh, friends, let each of us decide that we are going to accept Jesus as our Savior and that we are going to follow him that we are going to follow his example in everything, that we are going to keep his commandments, 
that we are going to have the faith of Jesus and that we are going to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Oh, my friends, it is my prayer tonight that each and every one of us will want to become part of God's people, part of his true church, part of that group that is ready and waiting for the coming of Jesus. Oh, my friend, make that decision tonight as God speaks to your heart. Make the decision that come what may, you are going to be one of those faithful believers who are true to the Bible, that are true to the teachings of Jesus, that are true to Almighty God the Father. Oh, friends, let us examine our hearts tonight in the light of God's Word. Are you willing to open your heart to God's truth tonight? Are you willing to make the decision to follow that which you know to be His will for your life? That's all He's asking, a willing heart that will follow Jesus and be ready to meet Him when He comes. I've invited my friend Sonia Timano to come and sing to us again tonight. Sonia, thank you for sharing with us. We look forward to your message in song. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia. 
What a beautiful, moving, and challenging message. If ever I've loved thee, my Jesus, it is now. I know that's the song of your heart tonight. And my friends, that Jesus that you love is reaching out with open arms to you tonight, with nail-scarred hands, and he's saying, if you do love me, then keep my commandments and link up with my people who keep all the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Oh, friends, why not make a decision that you are going to be part of God's people who keep the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus, and are waiting for his soon coming. Oh, my friends, it is my prayer tonight that everyone listening to this message, wherever you may be across PNG, it is my prayer tonight. religious confusion we see about us today. Thank you for giving us an outline of the history of the church. And thank you for giving us the identifying characteristics of your people in the last days. Those who will be ready and waiting to meet Jesus when he comes. Those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Oh Lord, each one of us want to be in that group. Keep us true and faithful to you. And when Jesus comes, may each one of us be found ready and waiting to meet him. For this is our prayer. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Oh, my friends, it's been wonderful to be with you tonight. Tomorrow night is the final night in our series. We have a program tomorrow night, and then the last program, Saturday midday, Saturday 11 o'clock. And friends, I want to invite you to ensure and to make certain that you are with us for the final night tomorrow night, and then for the final program on Saturday. Until then, may God bless you. May he take you safely to your home tonight. May he give you a good night's rest and a wonderful day tomorrow, and then bring you back tomorrow night as we continue our study of God's Word, the Bible. Good night, friends, and may God bless you.